this up here until everyone gets in. So last time we, uh, for the two people who are new today, we, uh, we didn't start right in with labels. We'll get to that today. But uh, we uh, began talking about uh, some mathematical preliminaries we need. And uh, then our goal was to end up talking about the sampling theorem, which we will do very shortly. But before I get to the sampling, and that's a very nice uh, plateau because that does lead naturally to certain types of wavelengths. That's the reason I'm doing it this way. Uh, but in order to get to the sampling theorem, uh, uh, we, we uh, talked about the Poisson summation formula. Okay? So that's where we went last time. Did a little real analysis, uh, sort of a mini course in elementary Fourier analysis, and we ended up with this great formula, which is not always true, namely the plus information formula. And there are lots of different and equivalent ways to write it, and the way we wrote it last time was as such. Namely, uh, that in terms of its uh, Fourier transform. And um, now, I, uh, I'm not going to go through all those definitions again because the two new people can just check the video and, and see because there are different ways of normalizing the Fourier transform. And I have my own cut way along with a lot of the rest of the world. It's not even Socratic. But, uh, uh, but with, with that normalization, this is equal to some half half of uh, n over t, then e to the two i i n t over t. And what I emphasized, one of the things we really talked about last time, was we talked about the uh, uh, the uncertainty principle. I demonstrated it uh, in the piano experiment. And uh, we'll have a lot more to say about the uncertainty principle because wavelet theory and a lot of other subjects underlying those theories uh, is the impact of the uncertainty principle. And we did some substantive examples, like the Gaussian, and uh, we did quite a bit last time, so in some sense. Uh, and I just wanted to reflect and observe that this is also a manifestation of the uncertainty in the sense that if we have uh, functions and we look at their values, uh, so for a fixed little t, we look at their values spaced by uh, capital T. So t plus capital T, t plus two capital T, et cetera. So there's that spacing you're looking at. And basically, when you write this down in terms of the Fourier transform, if t is big, then the Fourier transform values are spaced at little or smaller individuals. Okay. And, and in the sense that I talked about the uncertainty principle last time, this, uh, this also manifests itself. And uh, as I said, this result is not true in general. And proofs for certain functions are not so difficult. But when you just get off the uh, beaten track just a little bit, the proofs are very difficult. So I'm just going to give a reference with the proofs because we do want to get the wavelength theory. And so there's an article in the uh, journal Fourier Analysis uh, and Applications, which we wrote back in, uh, it appeared in 97. So, and we get this in the library. Volume 3, 
some of the uh, subtleties that can happen there. It's, a, it's some of an amazing phenomenon. Is that available online? What did you say? Is that available online? Yes. Oh, I think it is, yeah, because the uh, uni it's a Berkeley's a publication the university subscribes to it, so I think it's online. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and one of the ways this, uh, if t is equal to zero, uh, by the way, this really says in this form that f and f hat have to both be continuous because we're talking about point values of the function. Now, for the L1 theory, et cetera, they don't necessarily, they are not necessarily continuous. But for this formula, to be true, a uh, necessary condition is that f and f hat are continuous functions. So when t is equal to zero, this formula becomes um, t sum. Okay, and uh, in this article you'll see lots of conditions for which this is true. And basically you need, in general, I mean there are, there are pathological cases, but basically you need a little smoothness and you need a little decay. If you don't have enough of one or the other, then the thing is false. In particular, there's a spectacular example, which uh, Caps Nelson a number of years ago, it says there exists f in L1 of r, and since we're taking the Fourier transform at point values, we have to be taking f in L1. But there exists f in L1 such that, of course, f hat is automatically continuous by what we said last time, such that f is continuous. And um, Fn at n is equal to zero for all integers. And F hat of n is equal to zero for all integers that are not equal to zero. And F hat of zero. PSF fails. Here we have uh, a T. So it's rather spectacular when you think about it because it's a formula that uh, you, uh, if you play this game, it's sort of a knee jerk reaction to use this, just like at a certain level of calculus, sort of a knee jerk reaction to use information in the past. Uh, but just not true for them. They have to be kept. Okay, so basically, oh. yes, Brent. Um, you were saying that it's got to be an L one for the Fourier transform to be defined point wise. Which is all. Which is all we've defined it for explicitly in L two. Uh, if it's in L one intersection L two, then of course it's okay. But if it's uh, if it's just an L two function then there are probably cases where we can do it point-wise. But in general, because of the definition of the Fourier transform and the L2 function, things get a little bit more baroque, I would say. Well, I actually, it was the material last week about that L2. Um, you defined it in terms of basically a limiting operation on L2. Right. Essentially, that limit can exist even though the integral that defines the Fourier transform yes. doesn't? It doesn't. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of an amazing thing. It's a complex definition. Uh, even though the space L2 is such a useful space because it models you know, finite energy. So that's the way it goes. Okay, so now, one of the, I, I want to, in the, sort of the first half of today's lecture, I want to get across an idea. And so I'm going to, even though the first half of last lecture I, I essentially blew, I'm going to dawdle a little bit because the idea is very, very fundamental and will 
serve us well in subsequent lectures. And there is a intimate relationship in the sampling theorem, which I'm about to say, and subsequent issues with uh, wavelet theory. Uh, the uh, is uh, that uh, it's involved in proving the sampling theorem. And it turns out that sort of a straightforward way of proving the Poisson summation formula, uh, excuse me, proving the sampling theorem in terms of the Poisson summation formula. But since I'm not proving Poisson summation, uh, and I do want to prove the sampling theorem, I'm going to do that directly. But uh, basically, Poisson summation <coughs> does yield the sampling formula. That could sort of equivalent. But I'm going to prove the sampling formula uh, directly using more classical means. And you'll see this intimacy between uh, periodicity and discrete subgroups of the group, et cetera. Now, I have a question, Brett. We just asked that question. Could you, is your question on the microphone? They heard you ask the question? Okay. I'm pretty sure. Now, so what does the uh, sampling theorem say? Well, in order to state it, let's uh, define the following space. P, W, omega. P stands for Cayley. W stands for linear, and omega is going to stand for bandwidth. And this is going to be the set of all functions f in L2 of R, such that the support of f hat is contained in minus omega omega. And what all that means is that that is f hat equal to zero almost everywhere. And those of you who don't know almost everywhere, you don't have to know, as I said last week. But f hat is equal to zero almost every, everywhere off of minus omega. So these are band-limited functions. And so this that's very useful in a lot of applications. And now the uh, sampling theorem, theorem and I, I tend to call it the classical sampling theorem. And in a lot of the literature, you see it named after Shannon, the Shannon sampling theorem. Now, Shannon was truly a genius, and he did very deep things, and this is not deep, especially since it was known at least 100 years before Shannon. So uh, basically, Cauchy gave a proof of it back in the 1840s. So uh, uh, just to get the history a little straight on that. So let's talk. Uh, and, and the result says, let's suppose we have two numbers, t over in the time domain and omega in the frequency domain, such that t omega is less than or equal to 1. And let's take a function, s, in the paley wiener class, where the paley wiener class here is going to be 1 over a 2t. And I'm going to draw a picture of this, because the picture really is worth a thousand words in this case. Such that, uh, and I'm going to skip you almost everywhere for this, but such that f, s hat is equal to 1 on minus omega omega and s hat equals 0 off of uh, minus 1 over 2t, 1 over 2t. Okay. When I draw the picture, you'll see that all makes sense. Then, for every f, in L2, oh, excuse me, I want to take a picture. For every F in the uh, paley wiener space omega, uh, we have the following formula. F is equal to T times the sum F of N T times the translation by nt of x. 
And this is in L2 norm. And uniformly, on ah. So once again, there's something interesting going on, on here uh, that is not 100% apparent, but first of all, I'm saying things are uniform, and these are all continuous. Uh, well, anyhow, it turns out that, uh, that because S is in the Paleoena class, that means S hat is in L2, but it has compact support, which also means it's in L1, which means that almost everywhere S is continuous. So basically, uh, we're really dealing with continuous functions. In fact, we're dealing with entire functions. Can you say that again? That, uh, that last uh, statement? Yes. Uh, uh, basically, S is in one of these Paleoena spaces means it's Fourier transform has compact support. Since it has compact, and we, since it's in L2, that means S hat is in L2 by the partial up here. Since it has compact support, we've got an L2 function that's contained in L1. So therefore, its inverse Fourier transform, which is S, is continuous almost everywhere. So we're going to take it to be continuous. Okay. So now, let me draw this picture and then uh, see how we prove it. So what, I, what these hypotheses say is the following. We've got uh, zero there, and we've got omega. And let's take the case with, so I can draw the picture better, where that's uh, one is greater than that. So that means omega is less than one over two t. So here's one over two t. And I've made it so things are symmetric, although you can move things around you bring in modulations as you might expect. And when I, and we're over here in the, uh, the Fourier domain, so I've got, I've defined a function S so that S hat is equal to 1 on this space. It vanishes outside of here, but it can be anything really. Uh, do this and uh, let me bring it down here. It looks like that. And up here, it doesn't have to do anything like that. It come down and um, So that's my S, that's my sampling function. That S is for sampling. And so now, why don't I take, I'm going to take functions out that are in uh, the Paleoena space omega. So that means F is going to be, um, again, uh, to, just to distinguish it from the S hat, let me bring it way up here. Basically, what the sampling formula says is sort of remarkable that we can uh, write down this function f in L2 norm and uniformly because it's a continuous function, and just in terms of these discrete values. And the way this was originally studied, not the way Cauchy originally proved it, but in the early part of the 20th century, century, it was originally studied by mathematicians in terms of analytic function theory. And when I first stumbled across it, I actually read it in an engineering book, and the fellow devoted about three pages to its proof. And that really seemed like overkill. And so, the, because it's really elementary analysis. Uh, and uh, so let me show you how to prove it. Oh, before I do, uh, let me show you how this leads into wavelet theory. So I'm not going to actually tell you what a wavelet is now, but when you see what a wavelet is, you'll say, oh, gee, this is uh, let me just give an example. So, uh, example. Yeah. 
question there, Kevin? Uh, <clears throat> but the, 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 the T N C S is that a translation of S by N C S? Oh, I didn't define what that was. I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. So ta, thank you for saying that. Ta N T of the function S at T is equal to S of T. Okay, so you remember last time we talked about dilations, and the if we take any old function uh, f, let's just write this one, f of uh, omega, the way we did it last time, because I wanted L1 normalization, it was omega f of omega. By the way, uh, just as a remark, Nate is obviously not here tonight, and he's the uh, scribe for the homework as far as keeping the PDF file going. But you had enough homework problems last week, so you may not get your homework problems by the weekend, is what I'm saying. Uh, but that's okay, there'll be plenty to do from last week or you know, studying this material. Yeah. Okay, so now remember we, uh, let, let's, let's, Consider the function s omega t in terms of that Dirichlet curl that I defined last time. And so that was a uh, okay first break tonight. I went long this time. Uh, d two uh, pi omega t. And for those of you who were not here last time. This is just the sign. It's a slight adaptation of the sync function. 2 pi omega t over pi t. And now I want to take, with the sampling theorem, I can take one bigger than 2 t omega. But just to fix ideas for the moment, it turns out this is the case when T omega is equal to 1. Because remember, recall that uh, in this case we're looking at the inverse Fourier transform, that the inverse Fourier transform minus omega omega uh, inverse Fourier transform of at T is in fact S omega t. So we did that last time. And so this is a case where if you have 2t omega equal to 1, then none of this uh, frilly stuff is, uh, is there in the, uh, on the end. And this really just ends right here. And it's zero for us. For us. And it's really interesting. I haven't done this in a number of years. And maybe with the, the speed of computers right now, you don't notice it. But uh, didn't have a super fast computer, you can actually notice that when you do the sampling formula for this sampling function, it's slower. And one of the reasons it's slower is because this function here, it's in L2, it's not in L1, and it just sort of dawdles off to infinity. So, uh, okay, now, so, uh, Pad B, which is going to lead to the wavelet theory, is uh, set. This is the notation we're going to use with wavelet theory. So this is going to be like data who all of them again. Uh, quarter break, a baseball player. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, is 1 over the square root of 2 omega s omega. I'm going to let B0 be equal to the span, closed linear span, of all the translates by NT of T. And I'm going to write down some words which I'm not going to explain now, although by the end of this class I probably shall, but they're going to be a staple for wavelength. 
this will lead to an MRA, which uh, stands for multi-resolution analysis. Yeah, but I'm, we'll be talking a lot about this. So I'm just saying this is a uh, like a precursor. I, I'll be very precise when I and not only that, but if we uh, set psi of t equal 1 over the square root of 2 omega, s 2 omega t minus s omega t, This side is the before Shannon gets stuck with this many two of them, right? Shannon uh, dyadic wiggle. In particular, that, I think that's all I'll say now, because then when you see what wavelengths are, this will all fit in. This is a nice example that an hour from now, when we talk about wavelengths some more, will fit in. But the reason I'm mentioning it now is because this is also a sampling function, which the sampling thing is for. And this is a segue. Not in some sense, it is a segue. Okay, now let me prove the sampling thing. So proof of the classical sampling. Well, because of the uh, Parserell and Parserell theorem, and by the definition of support, we look at f minus, and I'm just going to take a partial sum here, the sum n less than or equal to cap n of uh, f of n t. Let me put the t out here, sorry. T n t. Uh, so t. Uh, and it translates by n t of s. And I'm going to look at the L2 norm of that. Then by Poncherel, what is that equal to? Well, I just take the Fourier transform of everything inside, right? So that's equal to the L2 norm, and it's convenient to put the gammas in here because I have an exponential one. Uh, minus t, the sum, uh, n less than or equal to cap n of f of n t. And then, remember, uh, we have translation goes into uh, modulation. We talked about that last time. And that goes into uh, e to the minus 2 i i n t gamma s hat of gamma. And now we're in the L2 norm over the frequency domain. So I just used Poncherel's theorem. All okay. And, and basically I have a translation here, so the Fourier transform goes into the Fourier transform of a function times an exponentiation. And we get the, this shouldn't be confused here, this is a half. And we get the T there because it's really gamma over the length of the interval, and the length of the interval is 1 over uh, uh, t. Minus 1 over 2t is 1 over t is 1 over t. Okay, now what's this equal to? Well, this vanishes outside of minus omega omega. This vanishes outside of minus 1 over 2t and 1 over 2t. So this is actually equal to, and I think I'll leave the picture there and continue the proof over here. So this is equal to the norm of uh, f hat of gamma minus t sum uh, f hat of n t n less than or equal to cap n. I'm just going to write the same stuff down, but I want to emphasize the fact that 
of where my domain is. 2 pi i n t gamma s hat of gamma l2 of where am I in between 1 minus 1 over 2t and 1 over 2t. Okay, so I may be seeing your feet now, but uh, this is actually very important. And here is, if I prove this theorem by the Poisson summation formula, I'd have to do something like this, except that I could do it to look a little more magical, because I'd be looking at discrete subgroups and stuff like that. It's really the same idea. But here's where we have to use Fourier series, which really comes down to looking at the discrete subgroup of R. So now we're going to let, we're going to define, define G in L2 of the torus of length 1 over t as follows. G hat of gamma is going to be equal to f hat of gamma as long as gamma is less than omega. And it's going to be equal to 0 as long as omega less than or equal to gamma uh, less than 1 over 2t. And define 1 over t periodically otherwise. Uh, and define 1 over t periodically on r hat. And bad joke, periodically we have to mean once in a while. Say it's a bad joke. It's obviously a bad joke. Oh, it wasn't a joke. <laughs> now, we have a periodic function now. So that means we can at least formally talk about its Fourier series. And so I, I, whenever I make these brilliant blackboard decisions, they turn out to be not so brilliant. Uh, and so, uh, can you get this board, Brad? Well, you can. Okay, so lucky. Uh, okay. Got a question. Was that correct? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm capable of getting into tremendous squad lines. So no, thank you. Can you go to G hat, then capital G? No, since I'm, I'm just going to leave it as G, and using caps for being a okay. uh, frequency set. Okay, so now the Fourier series. but I'm going to write them down explicitly. E to the minus 2 pi i n t gamma. Right? Where, and remember Fourier series don't make any sense unless you define the coefficients in the Fourier series way, where, and does the squeaking of the boards uh, really come in on the microphone, right? <laughs> By the way, before they redid the rule, these boards did not squeak. <laughs> In any case, where G check N is equal to, well, what is it? It's the integral over the torus. So I'm going from minus, well, it's over this torus. Let me do it in two steps. 1 over T of a G of gamma E to the 2 I I N T gamma. Now, what is that equal to? That's equal to, uh, I, I'm normalizing this. I mean, I'm using normalized time measure, as I mentioned last time. So what I have here is I have t out front. But the support, but this is equal to 0 outside of minus omega omega. And inside minus omega omega, it's f hat. So here I am at minus omega omega, f hat of gamma the 2 pi i n t gamma t gamma and voila that baby is equal to t f of nt so these Fourier coefficients
coefficients look like something we're going to see in the sampling test. Okay. Now, I, I, I can erase this here because this one line is equal to this line here. So we can rewrite, I'll give it a number, I guess. So therefore, let's call this uh, one. So therefore, one equals uh, f hat minus s n of g s hat, where I'm taking the L2 norm on minus 1 over 2t, 1 over 2t. And this is just the partial sum um, of the Fourier series. So this, this guy here is equal to the sum g check of n e to the uh, minus 2 pi i n t gamma, where n is less than or equal to that. So the, the item we were interested in to begin with, namely this formula, at least up to partial sums, is actually equal to this. And I had to do Fourier series to get this one. And now, I'm just going to add and subtract g, capital G. If I add and subtract capital G, this is just equal to, uh, or I have to try one so, uh, f hat um, minus g, and I have my L2 norm, one, minus 1 over 2t, 1 over 2t, plus L2 norm of G minus S N G S X L2 minus 1 over 2 T 1 over 2 T. But what is this? This is zero because of the way we find G. to 1 on minus omega omega. So g is equal to 0 on side that. So this baby is actually equal to s hat g minus the partial sum of the Fourier series of g. Minus 1 over I took S hat to be bound. This is the only place I need S hat to be bound. So this is less than or equal to the L infinity norm of S hat. Times G minus S N G. L2 minus Last time, I did not prove this. You've got to believe me that it's elementary, and you should never believe anyone my age. So go to a book and verify that this actually is easy to prove that this goes to zero. If you're looking at any of this stuff in my harmonic analysis book, I will see I did it someplace there. Uh, this goes to zero. It then goes to infinity. By, uh, so this is in theorem. B, point four, point twelve C of harmonic analysis and applications. That's a very standard result and an elementary result. I'm not lying to this. How did um, how did you get S hat times G and F? By G me? Yeah. Well, so this part you still see you see the S hat. Yeah. All I'm saying is that S hat is equal to one oh, on okay. minus omega omega. And this thing vanishes outside of my yeah. So 
So we just proved it, by the way. I mean, it was just some really elementary stuff. So this is plot, plot, interest, and And uh, the only thing we did that was clever, and it was really clever, was that we had to all of a sudden say, uh, gee, maybe we, let's see what 4A series combines. Now, this idea has been jazzed up significantly uh, in, in many uh, contexts. And so let me just uh, briefly, I don't want to go into this in this course, but uh, let me just mention that this idea of discretization of, uh, of groups and you have abelian groups to look at the Fourier analysis goes with it. If you don't, look at the corresponding representation theory. There's lots of generalizations. So let me just give a couple. Uh, um, this is no proofs here, I'm just going to tell you stuff culturally speaking. So, uh, and as I mentioned, what I really did here is the Poisson summation formula, but I didn't want to do it explicitly because we get a little bit opaque, but the best way I know to do it is with Dalton methods. So, we got a very straightforward down to earth proof. Anyhow, yeah, plus summation formula applications. And one of the things uh, one sees in, uh, um, frequently in the, in the engineering literature, is a formula like this. Uh, that T and the sum of delta and T, Dirac delta functions is equal to the sum of E to the 2 pi i t n over t. Now, in both cases, I'm summing over all this. Now, because the right hand side is absolute nonsense in any classical sense, the left hand side, those are measures. But so where delta has a measure at a certain point p has to operate on a test function f. And that's f. So when you took 630, for those of you who did, if you didn't, don't worry about it. But if you did take 630, that just defines a probability measure. And that's it. Uh, and if you don't know what that is now, let's not worry about it. Right? But, but I'm, I, want, I still want to give you an exercise to that effect. And remember I talked about delta when I talked about the uncertainty principle last time as this meaningless function. Uh, but it does have it's a measure, and that's how you define it as a measure. Uh, but you want to think of it as something that's, uh, this is the disadvantage of having my voice recorded about this live, about the same. But you want to think of, about it as a function that's uh, uh, so tall at a certain point that its interval is one, and it's, it just vanishes off that point. But uh, when you define this this way, it makes sense. Well. Look at that. Uh, th th that. That is another manifestation of the Poisson summation function. So, as one of the exercises, I think it's one of the new ones they gave, I wanted you to write down partial sum, do math well. It will be in the formula, which you have in the formula you have. Write down partial sums of this. And when you write down partial sums of this, I mean, just look at uh, sines and cosines for the moment. You look at the uh, sine. Uh, the, the cosine you do this, and then you, and it keeps going of course, and then you look at a, uh, a higher frequency, and it's going to come down uh, like this, and like this, and like this, etc. and go up again. It looks like a tool. guys up, what you're going to get is you're going to get lots of cancellation in the middle, and you're going to get these things are all at one. You're going to be adding up ones. So you're going to be getting deltas at, one, at zero and one. So it's a very illustrative uh, computation to show that this actually does make some sort of sense. Okay, and then uh, there's the classical sampling theorem that I just stated. But 
and prove them. But that's quite, quite generally true. I mean, basically, I, if you know the whole group not package in your group, then more or less the same group goes through. Okay, I'll have to speak some of them sort of And in numerical analysis, basically, it's a staple in elementary numerical analysis books to start off with something the, like it's called the oil and the equations. So, uh, Basically, that formula uh, is a T, if you just write down some of the things we've done, F of N T, just start on the half group here, N equals zero to infinity is equal to the integral from zero to infinity F of T, dt plus error terms. And so if you want to evaluate integrals, Tremendous amount of numerical analysis is based on this. You want to evaluate some complicated integral, then you can start off by making estimates on this, plus taking into account the error. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it easy because sometimes you want to evaluate sums, and it's easier to look at the integral. But anyhow, this is a true formula for the, under the conditions of when the sample is finished. How fast does the error decrease? Oh, it depends on the function. So that's easy, although it leads to a very deep properties in numerical analysis. This is easy, even though it looks like very abstract numerical analysis. This is true in the weak topology, and, and, and it's a very nice numerical exercise to do this. But there are very deep properties of this uh, result, and so there, there are these, there's a famous Jacobi formula. And I'm only going to write down a very simple case of it. Uh, they, they get a little more complicated. But uh, if you let uh, theta of t be equal to the sum e to the minus i n squared t, then one of the things that's a staple in uh, analytic number theory, I mean, one of the ways of proving that the the zeta function, for example, has an analytic continuation for the whole plane, except for the, uh, the curmudgeon in the pole, is, that, uh, is to use this formula, which says uh, that uh, for all t bigger than 0, uh, theta of t is equal to 1 over the square root of t, theta. by the way, is a reflection of the uncertainty principle. <coughs> but but it's, a, it's a standard thing. For those of you who have studied any analytic number theory, I mean, that's one of the things you do. I mean, there are other ways of do, making that uh, trans going over, but uh, that's one of the ways. It's also used, I mean, the theta function is used as uh, sort of the, when you start off doing diffusion equations, and that is the heat curve. So, uh, so diffusion equations. And nowadays, some of the things we're interested here in the Robert Wiener Center are uh, diffusion wavelets dealing with dimension reduction. I mean, this stuff has not gone away since the 1850s when Jacobi did it. Uh, you see it all the time in statistical mechanics. Uh, I must say I haven't done this in years, but I did spend five or six years studying automorphic forms and talk with all the time in that area. functions that arise, for a lot of these L functions that arise in the 
And I, it's been a long time since Deline did this, but uh, I recall that Deline's group was the Ramanujan conjecture. Okay, so this is theta in a significant way. And one of the deepest applications, and there's still a lot of business in this, is when you try to do this stuff in, non, in the non invading case and uh, things like the uh, Selberg trace formula. In some sense, is Classical sampling theory theorem, sort of in a, non in a uh, number theoretic non abelian set. It's all over the place. We, we sample all the time. We like to think we're getting a lot of information for less information. We always pay a price. Uh, okay, now the last topic I'm going to talk about before I start talking about wavelets is uh, the DFT. Uh, a lot of your applications, uh, some of the homework problems will be computer problems, and you're going to have to compute the Fourier transform uh, of functions. And the way that's done really is by computing DFT in a clever way, and you do it quickly by using Asperger transform. So I'd like to tell you, and, and by the way, it's all it's a it's just a very useful thing to know. So I want to say something about that, of how that computation actually works. When you get on a computer and you, someone says compute the Fourier transform or something complicated, sine square of t e to the minus something t cubed, blah 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 blah. Uh, and what you do is if you know MATLAB and type in the right thing, you get an answer. Well, what you're really doing transferring that into a discrete Fourier transform in a finite group called the lab. And then, of course, uh, you, they have fast algorithms like uh, you know, the fastest Fourier transform in the West. That's true. That's what it's called. Okay. okay. So I'm not going to prove things about this. Uh, the, the facts I'm, I'm stating of the DFT are, are elementary. And if you want to uh, see them, uh, they're, they're in chapter three of uh, my harmonic analysis book. Uh, and there's a lot of other literature on the DFTs. So <coughs> given, so the DFT, discrete Fourier transform. So given the group Zn, the integers mod n in the addition, OK? That's, that's a great thing of having this on. I don't have to write all that out. If I could speak, so let's take it. And now the Fourier transform of F, a function on that group taking complex values, is the function F the same group taking complex values defined by every n in Zn cap f n is equal to the sum of f m e to the minus 2 i I M N over N, where M is in Z N. Okay. And one of the reasons I use the definition I use for the Fourier transform on R or RD is twofold, actually. I never have to worry about constants out front. Because if you do any other way, you have to worry about constants out front. But 
really all the code for computers now uses that definition. So it's, a, it's very convenient. And typically, someone will, uh, a typical notation is to write uh, W, this is just notation, WN is equal to E to the minus 2 pi i. OK. Now, remember, last time I made a big deal about the uh, subtleties involved in inverting the Fourier transform. And I pointed out, that's when I, that's when I did my little dance about the uncertainty principle. I pointed out it was really an uncertainty principle I used. I showed you that formula. Uh, in this case, we invert it trivially. I mean, sometimes algebra, algebra is just uh, disgustingly difficult and just beyond me. But in this case, it, uh, uh, it's easy. And the proof depends only on the geometric series. And as I say, uh, so any calculations like this, they're all in my, my little book of every place else. <coughs> so what is the inversion theorem? It says the following. So this is this is the discrete Fourier transform. So F, even though I call it the Fourier transform, but F is by definition the discrete Fourier transform. So I mean it's a definition, it's the Fourier transform on this group. And because of that special finite discrete group, it's called the discrete Fourier transform. Okay. So the inversion formula. is uh, following. Given F and F F as above, then for all M and Zn, F of M equal to 1 over n sum n in Zn f of n then uh, well, I'm going to write w minus but let me just e to the 2 pi i m n and Okay, the proof involves the geometric series, and, and really that's all. Uh, I should point out, because people have spent a lot of time with this, that uh, if you look at this matrix here, that n by n matrix, uh, it's called the DFT matrix, or Fourier matrix, or something like that. If you look at that matrix, then uh, if you uh, you can see that as you, as you come down the diagonal, you're going to have e to the 2 pi i m squared over m. And if you look at those sums that are of that form, those, were, those are called Gauss sums. And they play a big role in lots of things, uh, quadratic residues if you're doing uh, algebra, and Gauss sums arise in lots of other contexts. But that DFT matrix, and at least one of you in this room, or two of you in this room have taken my frame course, that DFT matrix gives rise to certain types of what we call their uh, finite unit on tight frames. So it's uh, just one question. OK, so I'm going to close this uh, section before we start talking about wavelength systems with the following theorem. And I'm going to outline the proof because the proof is, will be an exercise. Quite interesting. We're going to call this the Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform theorem. And the reason I'm writing it down is it's going to give you a way of computing Fourier transforms on a computer. I mean, it's what really goes on. I'm not going to do the FFT. The FFT is another theoretic trick that goes back to Gauss to make what I'm about to write fast. But 
first of all, you have to write it down this way before you do the uh, the Gauss term, which uh, Cooley and two, uh, Cooley and Tukey discovered independently about 160 years later. Uh, so I'm going to write it down for a special case, but this, this gives the real hint of it. So that omega is bigger than zero. And let n bigger than or equal to 2 be even. And the reason I'm taking it even is just because I'm going to be dividing by 2. I don't really have to make it even. Um, choose t such that 2t omega is equal to 1. And I could have it so that it's less than 1. I'm just writing down a case that's, that's uh, good enough to see what's really going on. Now, <coughs> if f is in the Paleolena space, omega, then consider the dilation ft. Uh, not only as a continuous function on R, raise this over here now, <coughs> and as before, your question continuous for the reasons I said. The Fourier transform is uh, compact support. It does have almost non-continuous elements in its equivalence class, but since there's one continuous one, I want to take the continuous. So not only is a continuous function on uh, uh, R, but also as a function on Z, find in the following way, and I'm going to distinguish between Z and R uh, by using brackets, as I, as I did in the previous statement. So I have FT from Z into C, where an integer M is going to go into FT of M, but that's really going to be defined as FT of M. Okay, now I Oh, it sounds like I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth here, but does everyone understand what I mean by this? This f is a continuous function. This is the definition we gave of dilation of functions defined on the real line. Okay? I want to not only consider that ft as a function defined on the real line, I want to consider it as a function defined in the integers. And so to distinguish between those two, I'm going to use this but it's defined as a function defined in the integers. But this is just going to be the same number as that, where m is the real number. Okay? An integer would have to be real. Did I make it even more confusing? Okay, so let's take a vote. Did anyone understand it? Oh, that's, that's <laughs> I, If I could talk faster, though, I would have had more, more of you to think of it. <laughs> okay, so. Now. Assume Ft is in little l1 of z. And those of you who don't remember what that is, I just mean that is to say that the sum of Ft of m is finite. on minus omega omega. Okay? F is just an L2, so F hat doesn't have to be continuous, but let's assume it's continuous. Okay. Then, in 
and here's the kicker. Then, for every integer n, little n, in minus cap n over 2, cap n over 2, we have the following. We have an f hat of 2 omega n over cap n. That's equal to, because I have a 2t omega equals 1, that's equal to f hat of n over nt. But here's what it's really equal to. It's equal to the sum of m equals 0 up to n minus 1 of something I'm going to call f sub t with a circle because of periodization sub n, but I'm going to define it just a minute, at m times that um, discrete Fourier transform matrix term to the m n power. Now I have to tell you the pattern. Where Okay, so let's pause and see what this says. Here I want to compute, I've got a function on the real line, and I want to compute its Fourier transform. And I might be a very complicated function that I just can't do directly, like most functions. But I've got a high power computer. So I, but computers can't do things on the whole real line. You have to do a discrete Fourier transform to calculate. And so what? What we're saying is that we can compute that Fourier transform at a discrete number of points. Now I can compute that depending on what I take uh, n to be. Um, I can take lots of points. I take n to be large. So that I'm going to be able to compute f hat at lots of adjacent points where the, the distance between any two points is very small. So I'm really going to get a sense a feeling of what f hat really looks like, since I'm assuming it's continuous anyhow. On there. So that's the first thing I'm giving up, but except that I'm really not giving up much. It's, I'm really, all I can really do is compute discrete points. Anyway. But the amazing thing is that that Fourier transform, which is the Fourier transform on the real line, that really is da -da -da, a discrete Fourier transform. This is a discrete Fourier transform. That's the good news. The bad news is those coefficients are infinite sum. So that's the complexity that's involved. So if you give yourself some sort of threshold, some sort of error margin, where you can cut this down, that's how when you open up the, your little laptop and do a fast Fourier transform, that's the first step it does. Yes? Why is it obvious to have some convergence at all? No, 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 nothing is obvious here except that I gave some conditions about the L1, things like that. Oh, OK. Yeah. And there's a, uh, uh, and, and, and I'm going to give a, an outline of how to prove this, and the exercise is to fill in the details. Now, uh, this is probably well known, uh, but I've never seen it. I mean, it has to be well known to computers. Uh, so uh, I may have, I may need another uh, uh, hypothesis. That's part of your exercise also. Put the right hypothesis in. 
But uh, but let's uh, let me give you an outline of a proof because we really use everything we've done today so far. So by the classical sampling theorem, by so this is just an outline. So by the classical sampling theorem, uh, f is equal to t sum f of m t. And I'm sort of running on that right now. I'm uh, tau m t d 2 pi omega. That's the Fourier transform of the uh, of the of the uh, square wave from <coughs> minus omega to omega, the inverse Fourier transform. So that's what the that's what the classical sampling formula says. We did that. That's what we did. Now, once we have that. I can take the Fourier transform uh, uh, of that. So therefore, f hat uh, is equal to t sum f of m t. And this is just an outline, so I'm not going to address convergence issues or things like that. And now what do I have? Well, I've got the Fourier transform of that, which is this characteristic function times this exponential, because then the modulation. So it's E minus M T times the characteristic function of minus omega omega, where uh, E R is equal to E to the E R T. E R gamma. Here we've used a sampling form. So that's something we've done. Today. Now the next thing we're going to do is uh, we can write down. Uh, now can you, uh, you obviously can get it over here since you did before. Right? So uh, why the Fourier transform of the Fourier Why the Fourier transform of the degree three kernel? That's right. And basically, I've left out some, I'd say, uh, serious harmonic analysis here. But uh, if you define it the other way, or if you take the Fourier transform of the characteristic function, then you compute that it's the uh, Dirichlet function, right? The direct computation. And I'm saying that if I look at the inverse Fourier transform, you get the same thing. And you do just by the uh, uniqueness theory of the Fourier theory. Basically, for this course, I'm, I'm not uh, avoiding anything, but to get off the ground, I had to assume some stuff in Fourier analysis. And so when I told you the Planche out there last time, I did leave out uh, facts like the one you're just raising. But uh, it really is true what I just said. And uh, for example, if you, uh, once again, it's in lots of books, but what I just said right now, that's in chapter one of my book. Okay? It's believable to you. That uh, if I'm taking the Fourier transform of, if I take the Fourier transform of this, or well, the inverse Fourier transform, it doesn't matter. That's why I'm going to say the inverse Fourier transform of this, it's just matter of the plus and minus. Right? Then I'm going to get this. And all I'm saying is that there's a uniqueness theory that goes both ways that I did not do last time. And that would be in a, like a full semester course. Well, yeah, that's right. Sometimes inversion fails, but not in the L2 theory. OK, so we have, we have this baby here. Then, if I just start looking at, uh, if I take n now in minus n over 2, n over 2, I can get rid of that characteristic function. Because now I have then the f hat. Uh, is of 2 omega n over cap n. 
That's going to be inside here. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Because n is, say, say n is up near n over 2, then all I have is uh, omega. Okay, and that's the characteristic function omega. So this is just equal to t uh, sum f of mt e to the minus 2i i, and I've got a multiple here when I put it all in, mt, and then I've got the n, the 2 omega n over capital. And I don't have to worry about the characteristic function because I'm taking n in it. Okay, now is the place we have to, uh, how, how are we going to get this to be a discrete Fourier transform? Well, one of the things we do is we just uh, regroup. And so uh, we've got some things equal to 1 here. I put 2t omega equal 1. So this is equal to 1. And now I'm going to write this as t and the sum over all m. And now I'm going to look at these sums here. P goes from m n up to m n plus n minus one. So I'm going to I have each of these summons has m, excuse me, has n term, capital N terms. And so this is f of p t. I'm just uh, I get this infinite sum and every n capital n terms of them I'm going to sum separately. E to the minus 2 pi i pn over n. Okay. That still doesn't help me out to, get, to nail the baby, but let me make a change of variables now. So I can be summing from 0 to n minus 1 here each time. So when I make that change of variables, that's, uh, I'm going to say p equals j plus m n, and uh, j is going to go from 0 up to n minus 1. So that means this is equal to uh, t, sum over all m's, and now I can start all the time at 0. So I'm going to go from z j equals zero up to n minus one f of j plus m n t. Okay, it's looking an awful lot like that except the letters are different. The form is the same. And then I have e to the minus two i i. And this is a p, so I change it to j plus m n. So I have J n over cap n plus m n, which is going to be a 1. And that's it, baby. Because um, basically, I have e to the minus 2 pi i m n. That's 1. This is e to the minus 2 pi i j n over n. Okay, my m's and j's are mixed up, that doesn't matter. And this is the stuff I talked about uh, when I put that inside here. That's that f0. So this is uh, Roger over up. Okay. QED. Now it's not QED because I didn't verify the convergences and things like that. And I, some of those hypotheses I know I need. I see at least two questions. No? You willing to accept them? Boy, I'm going to try to sell you this, sell you this bridge in Brooklyn. <laughs> okay, very good. So that's all I want to say about uh, this business because you're going to be computing and this is how it works. So let's start talking about, uh, let's see, it's, does anyone want to take a break or should we just stop? A couple of minutes will be good. Yeah. Huh? A couple of minutes will be good. Okay.
Let's take a couple minutes right now. Five minutes.